Hello, and welcome again to Grasping Scripture. Thank you for joining us as we continue our journey through 1 Thessalonians. Today we'll be in the third chapter of Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica. As we begin to dig a little deeper into this passage, what we're going to find in today's chapter is simply Paul informing them of his intent, his desire for them, why Timothy went back to them and Paul didn't uh, to, to serve in that congregation for a while. And then Paul's joy when Timothy returns to him with the good reports. And then we get to hear Paul's prayer for that church and for his desire to return there again, his his hope and his desire for them as a congregation of believers and what it looks like living out their faith. So we get some insight into Paul and how he feels about this church and the unfinished work there and what his desires are. And he lays those desires out for both them and before God. So I think there's some interesting things in there. I'm glad you've chosen to join us and let's turn to the Lord in prayer before we dig into this passage. Join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. You have blessed us with your word, with the ability to study it, to learn from it, not just in an academic sense, but Father, to learn about you, about your work in this world, about who we are in relationship to you and what you have called us to do and to be. And Father, we thank you most of all for Christ, that atoning sacrifice for our sin, that we may be made right with you, not based on what we've done or haven't done, but based on your love for us and your grace poured out on the cross on our behalf. So Father, as we study this word, we ask that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that understands the voice of your spirit. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, as we look at the third chapter of 1 Thessalonians, we find this expression from Paul about him sending Timothy back to Thessalonica. See, they had been driven out by persecution, and Paul had actually uh, gone down to Athens, but he chooses to send Timothy back up to Thessalonica because he just he wasn't comfortable with leaving. It was necessary at the time, and he knew God was leading him forward to Athens and then ultimately Corinth, which is where Timothy rejoins him. But he just had this desire for the church at Thessalonica and, and knew their need for someone to be there to help disciple them. And so Timothy goes back, and we find that in these passages. Let's look at verse 1. Finally, when we could stand it no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy to visit you. He is our brother and God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. Now, what does that mean? co-worker, servant, and co-worker of God. Well, it means he serves God, and God has chosen to use him in this ministry of the gospel, in proclaiming the gospel, just as God has called all of us who are believers to go and make disciples. He has invited us, in fact, he's commanded us into serving with him in his redemptive work. Now, he does all the heavy lifting. Our job is just to be the mouthpiece. But God has called all of us who are believers and in right relationship with him, well, to be part of his redemptive work in the world by proclaiming the gospel. And that's what Timothy is doing. And so Paul is expressing, look, we all couldn't go back, but we all had a heart for what was going on there and for the people there. So we decided we were going to stay in Athens and minister here, and we sent Timothy back. And we, we commend him as that co-labor, that co-worker, that, that one who is proclaiming the good news of Christ and is our brother. It says, we sent him to strengthen you, to encourage you, 
in your faith and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles that you were going through. You see, Paul left under this cloud of persecution. They were, they were driven out, essentially, after just a short period of time there. But the persecution didn't stop. The Christians that were left behind, who were, were new to the faith, who hadn't been discipled very much, who still had a lot of questions and wondered about a lot of stuff, but they knew they were once lost and they'd been saved by the grace of God through Christ. And they clung to that. They were being persecuted by the Romans and by the Jews. They were being persecuted. And so Paul knew that they were suffering and he had concerns and he's going to express those concerns that, that potentially under that persecution, they might buckle. They might decide, Hey, you know, this whole Christianity thing, this whole following Jesus thing, that's not worth it. Look at the grief that it's brought into our lives. Our lives weren't this full of grief before. And they might decide it's, it's just not worth it. And that was Paul's concern. And he expresses that to him in the coming verses. But he sends Timothy back to kind of shore up their faith, to, to help disciple them, to help them grow in their faith, because they were new believers, essentially, when they had to leave. Well, again, let me pick up. We sent him to strengthen you, to encourage you in your faith, and then in verse 3, and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you were going through. But you know that we are destined for such troubles. Boy, isn't that a word of encouragement? Hey, but you know, we're destined for such troubles. In other words, if you are a follower of Christ, the world will hate you because the world hates Christ. That's it. You go, well, that's kind of harsh. How can you say the world hates Christ? Well, I didn't. Scripture does. And so if we align ourselves with Christ and we're proclaiming his message, the truth is, we're not going to be all that popular. We're not going to be all that well-liked. Because we stand in opposition to the evil and sinfulness of this world. If just by our presence, being followers of Christ, we're going to stick out. We will be a point of irritation and discomfort. Verse 4, Even while we were with you, we warned you, that troubles would soon come, and they did, as you well know. That is why, when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you, and that our work had been useless. What's he saying? He's saying, look, I was concerned after we left and you were just new to the faith and didn't have that deep foundation, you hadn't been discipled. Well, I was afraid that when push came to shove, you were going to bail. In other words, when, when troubles, when, when uh, persecutions began to, to happen in your life, that you would just decide, you know, this isn't worth it because you wouldn't have that grounding. Now, Paul's expressing, hey, that was my fear, and that's part of why we sent Timothy back, to help, well, to check the situation, and then for those that were still clinging to Christ, to help you grow in your faith and become solid in that faith. And Paul's just laying out his heart for him, going, look, this, this, is, this is what I was worried about. This is what concerned me, and so this is the action we took. Now we get the rest of the story. Starting in verse 6, uh, Paul usually turns things around in the letters that he writes. He presents some argument, and is it therefore, or there's this big shift. Well, here we, we get that big shift. It starts with the word by, verse 6. But now Timothy has returned. Now he just said, look, I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you. And that your work or that our work had been useless. He says, but now Timothy has returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. So he's saying, hey, I was worried about this, but it's not a problem. Timothy just got back with us 
and he has given us the update and he's telling us about your faith and your joy and and that you are still thinking fondly of our visit with you and you long to see us as much as we long to see you. He said, that's awesome. It's He was concerned, but now he's gotten this good report that not only sets his heart at ease, but is encouraging to him. And so he goes on in verse seven. So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in your faith. Now, you can imagine the encouragement, uh, or, well, I can imagine the encouragement anyway as a pastor. You you invest in the lives of others. You have the, the highest of hopes for them. You, you hope that they grow in their faith and that they serve God faithfully. And then you know of some challenge to that faith that happens in their life. And you can't have faith for them. They have to, they have to work out that relationship with the Lord. You lift them in prayer, you support them, you're there for them, you'll, you're, you're there if they need to talk or, or whatever. But you're concerned because you don't know which way they're going to choose to go. Will they turn towards Christ? Will they lean into Christ or will they lean away? And I can tell you as a pastor, that, that weighs heavy when you watch that happening. I mean, you want to pray, you want to encourage, you want to be there, and you need to do all those things, but you can't do it for them. And when you see folks lean into Christ, grab hold even tighter to that firm foundation of their faith, I can tell you from experience, it is greatly encouraging. And I I think that only scratches the surface of what Paul was experiencing. When Timothy came back with that good report, he's like, oh man, this is awesome. You know, he says, we've been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and sufferings, dear brothers. So in in the midst of what we're going through, hey, (laughs) to get that word that you guys, new in your faith, undergoing persecution, are overflowing with faith and love, wow. You know, I thought my day was bad. My day is just awesome. And he goes on in verse seven, because you have remained strong in your faith. That's why they're greatly encouraged in the midst of all that. They have remained strong in their faith. It gives us new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord. It is such an encouragement to those that have gone before you in faith, to those that have have proclaimed the gospel to you, have seen you turn to the Lord. It is such an encouragement to them to see what God is doing in your life. Don't be bashful about that. Share with others, not just the lost, what God is doing in your life. Don't just share with the lost that information. Do share it with the lost, but not just them. Share with those that have led you to faith, those that have poured into your life, those that have discipled you. Share with them too. It will be an incredible encouragement to them. Well, he goes on. Starting in verse 9, he says, how we thank God for you. And he's not just, oh, we thank God for No, he's like, oh, how we thank God for you. Why? Because we were anxious about your situation. We were we were concerned that maybe maybe you wouldn't hold fast to the faith. But we've we're now confident in that we have seen what has happened there. Timothy has brought us back this report. So not only are those concerns put at ease, but we now have this joy. This this it's like a new life in us. We've been reinvigorated because, oh, how we thank God for you. Because of you, we have great joy as we enter God's presence. Night and day, we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again, to fill in the gaps in your faith. In other words, we want to see you again. We're praying God will let us see you again. He is doing awesome things in your midst, through your lives. 
but you still need to be discipled and we're praying God's going to bring us back to help fill in those gaps. So Paul is just expressing that they do need to grow still, that there's still more work to be done there ministering among them, but but just what a joy and what a, a, a life-giving thing it is to get this wonderful report. Now, in closing out this relatively short chapter, we get the last three verses of it that are a prayer. And it is Paul's prayer about returning to Thessalonica, but he says some awesome things in there. Timothy's already brought them this great report, brought back to Paul and his associates, a great report about the faith and the love of the Thessalonian believers. Hear what Paul says in his prayer, starting in verse 11, going through 13. He says, May God our Father and our Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. And may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow, just as our love for you overflows. May he, as a result, make your hearts strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. Amen. Now, I want to unpack that prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. It is Paul's prayer from his heart about returning to this church, but also lifting up this church before Christ. To begin with, he says, May God, our Father, and Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. Now, he acknowledges that it's got to be God's will if it's going to happen. And he's praying that it be God's will. And that, that God would bring things about to make it happen. But he does something important here that needs picked up on. Because it's done often in a subtle fashion in Scripture, sometimes very overtly. Um, you know, there are those out there that go, well, the Trinity's not real. The Trinity's never mentioned in Scripture. And, and I will freely admit the word Trinity does not appear in Scripture. But there are numerous places, especially in the New Testament, but we see hints of it in the Old Testament, where the Godhead is mentioned, the Trinity, the three-in-one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here, Paul is praying not just to God the Father, but also to the Lord Jesus, equating them, putting them on the same level as the same thing. Why? Because they are whether we're talking Holy Spirit, whether we're talking Jesus, or whether we're talking God the Father, we are still talking about God in that perfect, you can look this one up, perichoretic union, uh, that perfect relationship union in and of himself, with himself. It's, it's hard to understand. It's hard to explain because it is completely other than who we are and how we relate. And yet through Christ, when we are united with Christ, God has invited us into that relationship. And that just blows my mind. But here Paul is hinting at that relationship with, may God our Father and Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. Well, he goes on, and may the Lord make, notice what he prays for them. May the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow. Now, they've already received a report back by way of Timothy about how the Thessalonian church is growing in their faith and their love. They are a loving congregation. They are a congregation rooted in faith, even though there's gaps there, what they've got they're hanging on to even though they're enduring hardship and persecution, they're still clinging to that faith and showing love. And I'll tell you, it makes sense. A community of faith that's being persecuted is going to pull together. They're going to support each other and love each other if they're following Christ. And that's a good thing. We are commanded over and over in the New Testament to show love for one another. 
to support each other, to encourage each other, to, to mourn together when there's loss, to celebrate together when there's cause for celebration, to encourage each other, to build each other up. Over and over again, we see that. We see that our first expression of love in the family of God, being his children, is towards the rest of his children. But the love in the life of a believer shouldn't stop with other believers. It shouldn't stop at the figurative, not literal, although it shouldn't stop at the literal either, walls of the church. We should have that love in the church. It should fill the church. It should be a a hallmark of the relationship between a brother and sister in Christ. But it should also spill over to the rest of the world. It's not circle the wagons and it's just about us. It starts here. But as it grows in our hearts, it overflows out. And that's what Paul is praying for them. They have that that love for one another. They are drawn together in faith and in love as a congregation. They're nailing it. But Paul doesn't want it to stop there. He knows there's more to it than that. So he's praying for them that their love for one another and for all people would grow and overflow, spill over. Just as our love for you overflows. If Paul didn't care about them, Paul never would have responded to that vision to go in the Macedonia in the first place. He had plans to go elsewhere, go back and read Acts, but God gave him that vision of a man from Macedonia standing. So he went. Why? He didn't know the Macedonians. No, but he loved them anyway. He loved his companions. He loved other believers, but that love overflowed to others as well. Does ours? I think sometimes we have a hard time loving those we're in the body of Christ with. And that's a real problem. That ought not to be. That's not who we're called to be. It's not who we're commanded to be. It's not who we're made to be. The hallmark of our faith and our relationship with each other in the body of Christ has got to be love. Is it? Because we're going to do a horrible job of overflowing that love to the rest of the world if we don't have it here. If we're not full, we can't overflow. Does that make sense? Well, he goes on. In 13, the last part of the prayer. May he, that being may Christ, as a result, make your hearts strong. When that love overflows, just like our love for you, he says, may he, as a result, make your hearts strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God, our Father. And when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. So he's saying, as you stand before God now and on the day of the Lord, the day of the return of Christ. And what's this about all his holy people? Well, some commentators say, well, he may mean the host of angels there. You know, that's possible. There's some Old Testament passages that may reflect that idea, but really, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Chapter 4. We're about to get there. But in chapter 4, starting in verse 13, there's a great explanation about the day of the return of the Lord and what it's going to look like. And so we'll unpack it next week when we get there. But I'm just saying, for me, I think he's talking about his holy people, the redeemed there, that we will all be united together and stand before Christ. And when he comes again, he's coming with the redeemed that have gone before. And we get to join. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do. We thank you. We thank you and we 
we ask that you would make our love for one another and our love for all people grow and overflow. And that you, Father, as a result of that love, would make our hearts strong and blameless and holy. Father, that you would convict us where we are not acting in love, living in love, speaking in love. Father, that you would convict us that we would repent before you and that we would move ahead in right relationship with you and with our brothers and sisters in faith. That our love would show the world you and that our love wouldn't just be limited to within the walls of our faith, but that as our love fills our hearts, it would overflow to the world that so desperately needs to see what love truly is. Lord, take us and use us for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.